Our reading from the Old Testament this morning is from Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 22 to 29. You must reserve a tenth part of whatever your fields produce each year. Eat the tenth part of your grain, wine, oil, oldest offspring of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God, in the location he selects for his name to reside, so that you learn to fear the Lord your God at all times. But if the trip is too long, because the location the Lord your God has selected to put his name is far away from where you live, so that you can't transport the tenth part, because the Lord your God will certainly bless you, well then, you can convert it to money. Take the money with you and go to the location the Lord your God selects, and then you can use the money for anything you want. Cattle, sheep, wine, beer, or whatever else you might like. And then you should feast there and celebrate in the presence of the Lord your God, along with your entire household. Only make sure not to neglect the Levites who are living in your cities because they don't have a designated inheritance like you do. Every third year, you must bring the tenth part of your produce from that year and leave it at your city gates. Then the Levites, who have no designated inheritance like you do, along with the immigrants, orphans, and widows who live in your cities will come and feast until they are full. Do this so that the Lord your God might bless you in everything you do. Our reading from the New Testament this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17, and then 20 to 28. And Paul is giving instructions to these folks at the church in Corinth about communion. So now, I don't praise you as I give the following instruction, because when you meet together, it does more harm than good. That doesn't sound like a good way to start this. Okay, speaking up on verse 20. So when you get together in one place, it isn't to eat the Lord's meal. Each of you goes ahead and eats a private meal. One person goes hungry while another is drunk. Don't you have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you look down on God's churches and humiliate those who have nothing? What can I say to you? Well, I praise you? Well, no, I don't praise you in this. I received a tradition from the Lord, which I also handed on to you. On the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this and remember, to remember me. And he did the same thing with the cup. And after they had eaten, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. And every time you drink it, do this to remember me. And every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you broadcast the death of the Lord until he comes. And this is why those who eat the bread or drink the cup of the Lord inappropriately will be guilty of the Lord's body and blood. Each individual should test himself or herself and eat from the bread and drink from the cup in that way. These are the words of God for the people of God. And, and we'll come back to that in just a little bit. But this morning we're going to take a little bit of time out from our, our series that we've been doing, Hashtag Struggles, following Jesus in a selfie-centered world. And we're going to just take a few minutes to talk about giving, tithes, and, and communion. And you know, as we talk about Tides and giving, you know, we, we all have a budget. I mean, I hope we have a budget, you know, for our homes. Um, whether you have one or not, you, you do, you know, and it's always made up of income and expenses. We know that what it's like at our houses to manage expenses and, and sometimes to even run on just absolutely bare bones. We also know when just income, not enough coming in, is a problem in itself. But all in all, it's about being good stewards, good caretakers of the gifts that God's given to us. And, and we read about it in that chapter in Deuteronomy, where we got the concept of, 
of a tithe, of people called to support God's mission. And it actually goes all the way back to the very beginning. It was in Genesis chapter 4, just the fourth chapter, where we hear the first time about people coming and bringing an offering of what they've been able to produce to God. That was Cain and Abel. But here in Deuteronomy, we get this idea about this tenth part. This tenth part. There was one tribe, the Levites, who were here to serve. And they weren't the farmers of the group. They weren't the producers of the group. They were just there to serve the Lord. And the other eleven tribes would give one-tenth to support that group and also to support the tabernacle, the, the, the meeting place of the Lord. So there, that's where the one-tenth came from back in Deuteronomy. And, and we need to talk about that a little bit, but I think rather than having me talk about it, I thought we might do it in a way that, well, there's a video. Well, we're called, we're instructed to give. And what God has given us and, and just how we share it amongst each other. And today is also Communion Sunday and it's a Sunday that we share and remind us of the gift that God's given us together. We call it Communion. Um, many places call it the Eucharist. And Eucharist is a word that just means good news. Or the Lord's Supper or the Mass, lots of different names. But we call it communion because it reminds us of the community of the body that we are through our Lord Jesus. He's the one that got it started, after all, and gave instructions to carry on its practice. Now, he, he, was, he, he gave it to us as he was preparing to go to the cross. And so he's given instructions, that, and, and he could have given a theological explanation. He could have given us a good, you know, university level kind of lesson about what this all means, but he didn't. He gave us an activity. He gave us a play, if you will. A play that's a, a representation of the events of our salvation of events yet to come. And you know that meal resembles very much another meal in the history of us. It resembles the Passover meal. The meal that occurred just before God's rescue of the children of Israel from Egypt. And here... Jesus is giving us the meal of our rescue from sin and death, from the work that He would do for us on the cross. And this meal that we're going to share truly represents the past, the present, and the future. He died for us that we would be rescued from sin and death. In the same way that the Passover lamb rescued the children of Israel from slavery in Egypt. It reminds us of how Christ is risen. That's the mystery of our faith together. And that we're reminded that Christ will come again. One day when we feast at that heavenly banquet. So this meal that we have is a, is a visible action, an outward sign of an inward reality, a method or a means by which we experience again the grace of God at action in our lives. We re-experience a time of grace. And I pray, I pray for us that each and every time we share the bread and we share the cup together, that the grace of God is especially present for every one of us. But sometimes, and actually 
fairly often amongst people, there's confusion. Confusion about who's worthy, who can, who, who can have this bread and cup, who can have this communion, and even a fear that kind of sits in the bottom of the, the gut that says, oh, if I do this wrong, I could be guilty. I could be guilty. It's that one verse in Corinthians that gets stuck in some people's minds. It's this one that says, For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That's why many of you are weak and sick. That sounds like it would be kind of scary and how that verse can get stuck for people. But we have to remember what was going on when Paul was talking about it. It's as if, and he's describing a situation, as if, well, it was Wednesday night. It's church night supper. And instead of bringing a meal that we all share together, everyone brought their own. And maybe they'd have a small group. Maybe two families would get together. They'd sit in their usual cliques. They'd sit in their usual chairs. And some of them had plenty to eat. In fact, they had leftovers that they'd probably bring home. And others who sat at that table over there, they didn't have enough. They had so little, but what little meager things they had, they shared. And there's another table over there in the corner who not only did they have plenty to eat, but they were drinking so much that they'd actually get drunk. Can you imagine if that would happen at our church night supper? And then... And then only after that do you say, okay, now we're going to be holy. We're going to have communion upstairs. So pack up your stuff, get ready. And that's the circumstance that he's actually talking about. He's not talking about people who come to the table of the Lord in honesty, in integrity, and in seeking to love the Lord. It's not a, a warning about a certain kind of purity. It's not a warning about our kind of righteousness deserving salvation, deserving community. It's a warning that we are a body of Christ, that we are together, and that we ought not to be making anyone feel as though they are not welcome. We come to this table together because we've been invited. We come because our Lord invited us to share this very meal that reminds each other of what Christ has done. That Christ is risen and that He will come again. Let's pray. Father, as we just meditate as we think for just a moment on what You've done for us, what You've done for us on the cross, that You rescue us, that You free us from slavery to sin to death. Oh, that we would be one in Your name as we come before You. Thank You. Thank You for what You've done. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.